my dear friends i welcome you all for today's cme on a very interesting and intriguing topic the super bowl few months ago this particular topic made headlines in our news and we all know the implications of that today i would like to elucidate the implications of this particular topic and also tell you about antibacterial resistance to antimicrobials that we use in other words the bacterial genetics also will be covered so before we talk on the specific topic let us dedicate this talk to one of the greatest scientists of all times alexander fleming alexander fleming has discovered as all of you know the penicillin in the year 1940 so here is a quotable quote from him in the very first slide with the dedication to this gentleman i read out the quotation the greatest possibility of evil in self medication is the use of too small doses so that instead of cleaning up the infection the microbes are educated to resist penicillin and a host of penicillin fast organisms is spread out which can be passed to other individuals and from them to others until they reach a stage where someone gets a septicemia or pneumonia which penicillin cannot say this particular statement is very true even even more so today because antibacterial resistance is very much on the cards and we cannot escape from antibacterial resistance whenever we are using powerful antibiotics so with this opening statement of dedication and quotation from fleming let us now look at the topic superbug so friends we will start this talk on superbug as usual as all our presentations are available on our website this particular presentation is also available on the website www.trsarna.in so i request you to make use of this website where most of the presentations in fact around 140 cv presentations are available are made available for free download by all of you so take advantage and use the website now in this slide that we see now on the screen we see that the who in its one of the journals uh, essential drugs monitor the year as early as 2000 itself it has given an editorial on antimicrobial resistance a global threat needless to say that this particular phenomenon or problem of antimicrobial resistance has compounded more with the advent of newer antibiotics and with this indiscriminate use of antibiotics and inappropriate use of antibiotics so one need to conquer antimicrobial resistance as you see here a patient who is admitted in a hospital he is the right person to succumb to majority of the infections around him hospitals are not very clean places they are places where the diseased and the sick people live uh, and with lots of uh, immunocompromised patients being there and the antibacterial resistance very much so there the patient who is admitted into the hospital particularly into the intensive care units is at a higher risk of developing uh, antimicrobial resistant uh, and anti microbial resistant bacterial infections and these could be possible because of the food they eat the air and the dust that they breathe and the water that they drink and the disinfectants that are used to clean the floors they sometimes remove the useful bacteria and then super growth of the harmful bacteria will occur the wash basins the toilets and of course the pet pants that is that the patients use and the iv fluids particularly contamination of the iv fluids either during the administration or during the and during the preparation for the iv fluid uh, infusion and of course the catheters that we use the indwelling catheters the urinary catheters the uh, intracats that we use in the veins all of them can get infected and the endoscopes uh, particularly the coronoscopes the ureteroscopes the sigmoidoscopes the apache endoscopy whatever the endoscopes we use all of them can cause the bacterial uh, onslaught on the hospital patient hospitalized patient needless to say that ventilators are the last 
passed on the camel's back and certainly endotracheal tube and ventilators are a very potent source of nosocomial infections and there is a separate section called VAP, ventilator associated pneumonias which are very prevalent in those who are on ventilators. So these are the various ways in which a patient in a hospital can get infected and it is hard duty to see that is as uh, germ free as possible in any one of these areas that he will come in contact with during his hospital stay. Now, most important thing that has happened for the last 50-60 years from the year 1940 or even slightly earlier when some formats were discovered for the first time during 1935 that the first antibacterial agents to be used. Then came the, the advent of penicillin by Fleming in the year 1940 when the beta-lactam antibiotics, particularly the penicillin and penicillin group of antibiotics, the semi-synthetic penicillins and other types of uh, penicillin related antibiotics have come into picture after the advent of penicillin. Then came of course in the 1950s the chloramphenic or tetracycline which ruled the roots for a long time, long long time and for any broad spectrum antibiotic we want either chloramphenic or tetracycline. The success of those two has, was phenomenal in those days. Then came the aminoglycosides, gentamicin and then the polymixins and uh, the aminoglycosides others like you know Nettlemycin and uh, the amikacin, these are the newer drugs uh, that have developed, that have come in the field of amino acids. Then came the macrolides. Macrolides and erythromycin is the prototype followed by oxythromycin, azithromycin, clarithromycin, and these are the macrolide antibiotics. Then we have got the glycopeptides. The glycopeptides are polymixins and cholestine and the bacitracine, these are the glycopeptides. Then in the year 1963-64 came the discovery of quinolones, particularly the fluoroquinolones, which have revolutionized the treatment of majority of the bacterial infections. And these quinolones, remember, have gone from step to step which, uh, with, the, with the provision to use better quinolones as days progressed. And unfortunately what happened, the quinolone resistance also started in the later parts of the last century. Then streptograms also have been introduced around that time. But up to that point, the growth was tremendous and phenomenal from 1935 to 1963. Many antibiotics have been discovered and they were uh, being used by the doctors. But then, there is a big invention gap or innovation gap between 1963 to 2000 where not a single new antibiotic has been added onto the armamentary and no new drugs have been invented. And now, Around 2000 again, a new group of antibiotics called the oxygolidiones. Oxygolidiones have been added and then of course we have got the lipopeptides. Like lipopeptides, now we have got lipopeptides and then the butylins as, as late as 2007 have also started. Now, several newer antibiotics are being tested to, to their efficacy against these drug resistant um, bacteria and uh, we, we have to hope that we will find some good drugs which will be useful for drug resistant treatment. This slide is mainly to illustrate that there is a huge gap of around 40-45 years between 1960s and 2000 years and during which period not many new antibiotics have really been added. Now, the mechanism of action of antibiotics will be discussed in the next slide. There are several ways in which antibiotics exert their effect on the microbes. The microbes, as you know, have got a bilayer cell wall. There are proteins inside, protein synthesis going on. There are nucleic acids. There is DNA of the bacterium. And of course, there is a cell membrane below the cell wall. Antibiotics can act either on the cell wall, like beta-lactam antibiotics, all the penicillins, semi-synthetic penicillins, cephalosporins, carpapenems, monobactams, vancomycin, bacitricin which are the glycopeptides and there are some of the antibiotics will act on the protein synthesis. The protein synthesis is, is halted in the bacterium, so much of the bacteria are killed. Drugs that contribute to the I mean, limitation of protein synthesis are macrolides, lincosomides, lincosomides, clarithromycin, chloramphenicol, 
tetracyclines, amino glycosides, and of course mucosin and binitrogen. Then there are certain drugs which act on the nucleic acids. These drugs which act on the nucleic acids are rifampin and then metronidazole. The most important group of antibiotics, the quinolones and novobiosin, act on DNA synthesis, most specifically on the DNA GIDH, which is an important uh, enzyme in the replication of the bacterial DNA. So the quinolones act by interfering with the DNA GIDH so much so. The, new, you know, the synthesis of DNA of the bacterium is halted and bacterium will die. Then there are certain drugs which act on the cell membrane and these are polymyxin, granicidin and daptomycin. Now, most important story about antibiotic usage is the inappropriate use of antibiotics. Inappropriate antibiotic therapy is Empirical antibiotic therapy can lead to inappropriate use if the antibiotic is not properly chosen and it can result in excess morbidity, excess mortality and the length of hospital stay may be increased. The cost of the treatment and cost burden on the patient will go up and selection of resistant strains will occur. A number of studies have demonstrated the benefits of early use of appropriate empiric antibiotic therapy for patients with nosocomial infections. This is because nosocomial infections are serious conditions. We cannot wait for the antibiotic sensitivity test to come in and then start putting the uh, treatment for the patient. So we have to give and shoot an empiric antibiotic therapy, take the samples for culture. Once the culture results are available, then switch on to appropriate antibiotics and withdraw the red antibiotics. Inappropriate antibiotic therapy can be defined as one or more of the following conditions. Ineffective empiric treatment of bacterial infection at the time of initiation, at the time of identification, or a wrong choice of antibiotic, or wrong doses, uh, smaller doses, or higher doses, or wrong duration, inappropriate duration, either shorter duration, or too much prolonged duration. Use of an antibiotic to which the pathogen is resistant is also called inappropriate antibiotic therapy. Now let us see the prescription patterns. We all are practitioners when we see a patient with the symptoms of uh, infection. We presume that all the symptoms are due to bacterial infections and we would like to put the patient on antibiotics. Sometimes these infections may not be bacterial infections. They may be viral infections or the same symptoms may be due to non-infective etiology. For example, let's say a patient is coughing and is coughing in the night. It could be cardiac failure. It could need not be bronchitis. It could be cardiac failure or paroxysmal dyspnea and nocturnal cough. Or a patient may come with severe dyspnea and wheeze and he may be having renal failure and not having bronchitis and exacerbation of COPD. So these are certain situations where we have to clearly exercise our judgment and see whether we are we treating an infection. The first question. If that is yes, is it a bacterial infection? Then if that is also satisfied. Then we are justified of course in giving an empiric antibiotic cow. Look here, in sinusitis, usually 50% of the prescriptions of antibiotics are unnecessary. They are allergic sinusitis. Only 50% of them treatment is necessary. Whereas when it comes to sore throat, again there are also 50% of the sore throats are viral or allergic in nature and they don't require antibiotic therapy. When it comes to the question of bronchitis, around 75% of the story is unnecessary antibiotic use. There are simple exacerbations of the obstructive airway disease and that unnecessary antibiotic usage. Necessary antibiotics only 25%. Common cold, whoever prescribes antibiotics for common cold, 100% of the time it is unnecessary as we all know. When it comes to ear infections, around 30% of the time the infections are treated unnecessarily with antibiotic, whereas the other stories are much more uh, alarming. This we have to keep in mind the about when we prescribe antibiotics. See the changing landscape for approved antibiotics and antibacterials. The bars here represent the number of new antimicrobial agents approved by the FDA, Food and Drugs Administration, USA, during the period under study. In 1983 87, 
as many as 16 agents have been approved by the AP. In 88 and 92, we have 14 agents approved. In 93, 97, we have 10 agents approved. In 1998 and 02, we have 6 agents approved. In 0, 3 to 5, we have 4 antibiotics that are approved. During 08, none of the new antibiotics have been approved with the FDA. This shows that there are no new discoveries coming in the field and not many new antibiotics have been approved for use in human beings. But look at the resistance. On the other hand, the resistance from 1983 till now is on the up upward trend, very steep upward trend in the uh, antibiotic resistance, antibacterial resistance. With the result, there is a mismatch. There are no new discoveries. There is more and more resistance. What will happen? We are faced with the older antibiotics which we are not able to use for these patients of antibacterial resistance. This is a very peculiar situation we are in now. We have to find out ways of developing newer drugs for the resistant microbes. So what are the causes of antibacterial resistance or antibiotic resistance? Uncontrolled, improper, indiscriminate use of antibiotics for therapy and prophylaxis. Inadequate length of therapy. Unnecessary use, lack of activity of the agent and insufficient doses. Low penetration of the antibiotic into body fluids. And poor patient compliance. We have prescribed antibiotics, but the patient has not taken the antibiotic or he has taken any small dose or to a lesser number of days. Poor hand hygiene and failure of infection control measures in the hospital and home environment. So much so, the drug resistant organisms are propagated from one person to another. Excessive use of cleaners, detergents and antibacterial agents in the hope that they will give clean environment. Antibiotic use in livestock, in other animals, in birds and in agriculture can also result in mutant variants of the bacteria which can become antibiotic resistant and produce antibiotic resistance in human beings. Now, antibiotics are a medical, medical miracle in the last 60 years. There is no wonder about that. There is no dispute about that. This is a that established the fact that the medicine has been uh, totally a new field with the advent of antibiotics where well, we could conquer all the infectious diseases. So much so, we, have, we are now left with more of degenerative and vascular, metabolic, cardiovascular problems. But again, antibiotic resistance is emerging and it is becoming a great threat and whatever ground we have covered uh, with these medical drugs is now being lost. What, will, what are the various mechanisms of antibiotic resistance? First thing is the Darwin's hypothesis of selection pressure or survival of the fittest. Second one is the innate genetic mutations that occur in the patient, in the, in the bacteria. That is not, extraneous material, genetic material is not added, but there is an innate change in the genetic sequence or genetic material of the organism itself. Then of course, you have got the other aspect of destruction or inact inactivation of the antibiotic that we are using. This is because of several enzymes produced by the bacteria, bacterial new genes, so, so much so, the bacteria is, are able to destroy the antibiotic. The best example is penicillinase producing I mean, uh, bacteria which destroy the penicillin. Carbapenemases producing bacteria which destroy, destroy the carbapenems. Beta lactamase, a generic term for penicillinase. Beta lactamase producing bacteria producing destruction of beta lactam antibiotics. The other mechanism is efflux of the antibiotic that has entered into the bacteria. The bacteria is able to throw the antibiotic out from its cell, uh, cell structure of cytoplasm, accepting resistant genes from other bacteria by genetic transfer and genetic transfer can be through the plasmids or through, or through the transposons. Transposons are short genetic segments and this transfer can occur due to conjugation or transformation or transduction. One of these three mechanisms can uh, produce the, the, the exchange of genetic material from other bacteria 
into the bat into one bacteria which becomes uh, resistant um, because of the new genetic material that has been added. Usually it is the plasmids and sometimes it could be due to transposons and the mechanisms of con conjugation, transformation and transduction will take uh, a role in, in, in exchanging this new genetic material from outside into the bacteria which becomes resistant. Now, the simplest example is resistance to penicillin. Penicillin resistant bacteria here, look here on the slide, you see the ring like structures which are the plasmids. These plasmids are genetically coded in such a way that they produce an enzyme called penicillinase. This penicillinase, the brown dots there, is produced by the plasmid and this penicillin is secreted into the environment of the, around the bacteria and it destroys the, the penicillin molecule. The gene for beta lactamase is coded in the, in the plasmid. So the beta lactamase or penicillin is produced by the, uh, by the plasmids and that penicillin is, uh, it effectively destroys the penicillin. This organism can freely now grow in the presence of penicillin. Normally it should have died in the presence of penicillin because of its activity to, to destroy the penicillin. So naturally it is able to grow in the presence of uh, penicillin. Look here at the beta-lactam ring that is present in the penicillin or beta-lactam containing antibiotics, beta-lactam antibiotics. The ring is between the carbon and nitrogen and the O group there in the extreme left hand corner and there is a link between the carbon atom with the O group there and the nitrogen atom and that is called the beta lactam active site and this beta lactamase or the penicillinase uh, destroys the antibiotic by opening up of the ring and the ring structure there and cutting off the connection between the carbon and the nitrogen so much the carbon now becomes CO, <coughs> COOH and then the nitrogen is separated from the carbon and the ring is opened up and once the ring is opened up the antibiotic is no longer able to exert its effect on the organism. This is how the penicillinase or the beta lactamase works in cleaning the penicillin molecule or the beta lactam ring. Now, mechanisms of antibiotic resistance can be to the structurally modified antibiotic target site, resulting in reduced antibiotic binding. That is, once the antibiotic binding site is modified, the target site, the antibiotic binding can be reduced or formation of a new metabolic pathway preventing the metabolism of the antibiotic. So, the bacterium learns either to reduce the binding or to have an alternate pathway and so much so escapes going through the antibiotic pathway. These are the two mechanisms. Look here in this slide you can see the green balls or the antibiotic, the red pillars or the cylinders or the, the target sites on the cell wall of the bacterium and, in, and the antibiotic has to get bound to the uh, cell wall receptors, the, the pillar like things, the cylinders and once they are bound, the antibiotic molecules are bound, they will go into the interior of the organism. Antibiotics normally bind to specific binding proteins on the bacterial cell surface. Now, let's say if the cell wall cell surface is to being cylindrical, now got changed, most of the cell wall receptors of the binding proteins are changed to specks or the rectangles, rect uh, rectangular pattern, um, cuboids. Then obviously the antibiotic molecules cannot get attached to the binding sites there, so much so that the antibiotic is wasted and it's not able to enter into the cell. And the mod modified target site is uh, not allowing the antibiotic to go and sit there on the on the receptor. So much so, you we have a problem of the antibiotic being bound to the protein binding sites, and so it cannot enter the cell surface and then enter into the bacterial cell. Now, altered uptake of antibiotics or decreased permeability. So, the, if the uptake of the antibiotic is altered, its permeability or the bacterium for the antibiotic may be reduced or the bacterium whatever antibiotic it takes in may throw it out by way of an mechanism called efflux. 
So either decreased permeability and decreased entry of the antibacterial substance into the bacteria or increased output from the bacteria you know, outside to outside and that is called the efflux. We will see the subsequent slides. Look here, again the antibiotic is the green ball and the cell wall receptors are the cylindrical red ones and there are channels what are called the pouring channels on the, on the cell wall and through these pouring channels the antibiotic enters into the cell of the bacterium and goes into the interior of the organ. You see the green balls are entering through the pouring channels and you see a substantial number of the antibiotic molecules in the interior of the organ. Let's say the permeability of the pouring channels is, is reduced so much so the bacteria um, cell wall rejects the antibiotic and permeability is reduced so not many antibiotic molecules can traverse through the new pouring channels which are chained in structure so much so they cannot the antibiotic cannot go into the cell or antibiotic enter the bacterial cells via pouring channels in the cell wall and then uh, normally these pouring channels will allow the antibiotic to go so there is what is called the entering there and then the antibiotic that, that enters there should stay within the bacterial cell so much so the bacterial cell is killed but here what happens is the, there is an influx or an active pump develops and this active pump inside the bacterial cell siphons out whatever antibiotic that enters inside the cell is thrown out through the other channel and through the pouring channel it comes in and through a new channel it, it starts exiting out so much so antibiotic is not staying inside the bacteria itself so much so the, the effect of the antibiotic is, is rather reduced or enough. so once the antibiotic enters the bacteria itself they are immediately excluded from the cells via active pumps or also called the efflux pumps now antibiotic inactivation the third mechanism is by antibiotic inactivation or cleanse so antibiotic inactivation means by producing specific enzymes bacteria acquire genes to encode those enzymes that inactivate the antibiotics these new genes will produce enzymes that are detrimental to the antibiotic and open up the rings the best example we can have is the beta lactamases or aminoglycoside modifying enzymes or chloramphenicol acetyl transferase these are some of the examples of the enzymes which are secreted from, from the modified genes of the bacteria and these enzymes inactivate the antibiotics to which they are targeted. So look here, the green balls as usual are the antibiotic, the new enzyme that is secreted by the, by the modified gene or mutated gene is shown in uh, like a red petal and that goes and attached to the antibiotic and this antibiotic is clean or it is so much so the binding will not take place once the red one the enzyme is attached to the antibiotic. You see in this slide, this uh, antibiotic, the enzyme combination will make the antibiotic not fit to be uh, bound by the uh, cell receptors, protein receptors. So much so, it is cleaved or inactivated or sometimes it may be just not, uh, the, not allowing the binding or it can even destroy the antibiotic like the penicillinase or the beta lactamase, as you see in this slide. So there are multiple mechanisms by which bacteria learn to evade the antibiotic. Bacteria learn to overcome the power of the antibiotic. What are the three main mechanisms? Modified target, altered uptake, drug inactivation. Either the target is modified by the genes inside or genes from outside or the uptake is reduced due to pouring channels, altered uptake or efflux or drug inactivation. That's the third mechanism which we have seen in the previous slide. Here are listed a group of antibiotics. Here beta lactams, majority of them, the resistance is due to modified target or altered uptake and because most of it is due to drug inactivation beta lactams. Glycopeptides, modified target is the only mechanism by which they become, they, they acquire resistance. Ammonoglycoside antibiotics, altered uptake and drug inactivation. Tetracyclines, altered uptake. Chloramphenicol, drug inactivation by chloramphenicol, the cell transferase enzyme. Macrolides, again modification of target. Sulfonamides, modification of target. Trimethoprim, C. Quinolones, altered uptake. Altered uptake because of the uh, change in the DNA garage. The DNA garage, DNA garage is, is altered. 
so much so the drug is not taken by the by the bacteria. So these are in nutshell the different mechanisms, uh, genetic mechanisms that operate in the bacteria to produce antibacterial resistance. So beta-lactam antibiotic resistance mechanisms are slightly different. There are three mechanisms of beta-lactam antibiotic resistance are recognized. One, reduced permeability. Two, inactivation of beta-lactamase enzymes. Three, altered penicillin binding proteins or PBPs. PBPs, PBPs penicillin binding protein. Either one of these mechanisms can occur uh, and operate to, to reduce the efficacy of beta-lactam antibiotics on the susceptible organisms. So either the organism learns to reduce the permeability or it inactivates the, um, the drug with the beta-lactam um, beta lactamase produced by the bacteria or it alters the protein binding sites or penicillin binding sites PBPs on the cell surface of the bacteria. So either of these three mechanisms, one of these three mechanisms can be operating whenever we are looking at beta lactamase producing antibiotics. And beta lactam is producing uh, bacteria and producing the um, problem. You see here in this slide, it's very clearly explained. A, the permeability is reduced, the antibiotic is, uh, is failing to pass through the outer membrane. In B, the, uh, the beta lactam are destroyed by beta lactamase and one in the periplasmic uh, space. And third one is the PVPs, the penicillin binding protein is uh, altered and poor affinity. So one of these three mechanisms could operate. Beta lactam antibacterial resistance is again uh, can be explained by two mechanisms AMPC and extended spectrum beta lactamase. Extended spectrum beta lactamase also referred to as ESBL. Extended spectrum beta lactamase production or through the AMPC mechanism. The two important mechanisms for uh, beta lactamase resistance in uh, NIs, that is nosocomial infections. The antimicrobial and clinical features of these resistance mechanisms are highlighted uh, in the subsequent slides. Beta-lactamase resistance uh, through, through ANC production is a worldwide problem. The incidence increases from 17% to 23% between 1991 to 2001 in the United Kingdom. Very common in gram-negative bacteria. This sort of AMPC production and producing beta lactamase resistance is very common in gram negative bacillus. Is usually this gene is cited on chromosomes but can be present on the plasmids. So it can come from directly from the bacterial DNA of the chromosomes or it can come from the plasmids which have got genetic material. Enzyme production is either constitutive, that is occurring at all the time, or it is inducive, only occurring in the presence of the antibiotic. Either it is occurring all the time or it is occurring only. And the antibiotic is exposed. Now, beta lactam resistance through ESBL production. ESBL is extended spectrum beta lactamase production. An increasing global problem found in a small expanding group of gram negative bacilli, most commonly with enterobacteria, enterobacteria species, usually associated with large plasmids. This is not through the bacterial genes but through the large plasmids. And then, so commonly mutants of TEM and SHV types of beta lactamases. There are several types of beta lactamases, uh, um, beta lactamases, out of which the TEM type and SHV type are the ones which uh, which produce ESBL production or increasing uh, numbers of uh, uh, extended spectrum beta lactamases um, producing organisms. Antimicrobial features of ESBL. ESBLs are inherit, inhibited by beta lactamase inhibitors, usually confer resistance to first generation, second generation, and third generation kephalosporins, uh, and then monobacterins like ejetrion and carboxypenicillins also are inhibited by carbonicillin. Varied susceptibility to piperacillin and tazobacter. Typically susceptible to carbapenems and sifomycins. Often, these are non susceptible to fourth generation cephalosporins. So, uh, susceptibility for carbapenems and cephalomycin is still retained, while the cephalosporins, even including the fourth generation, the monobacterins and the carboxypenicins, will not work in such a situation. So, this is a, a genetic map of the bacterium 
the busy genome of the bacterium, elements of horizontal exchange. Horizontal exchange means transfer of genetic material from one bacterium to bacterium of another species, not by, by transmission vertically by the, when the bacterium divides, but simple exchange of genetic material from one bacterium to another bacterium horizontally. So, genomic islands are there, the prophases, the conjugative transposons in gram positive bacteria, the super integrons, mainly the gamma protobacteria, and the integrons and the transposons again and the insertion sequences. These are several areas to which the genome structure of the bacteria is, is copied onto the other neighboring bacteria of different species. Minimal species genomic backbone this is called and the, the example that is shown here is E. coli the common 4.1 MB, Klebsiella 12 islands 0.53 MB and 0157 H7 islands are 1.34 MB length. So the, the duration or the length of the different uh, areas of genetic material vary but more or less all these mechanics contribute for the horizontal exchange of genetic material from the bacterial genome.